Hey everyone, in this video we're going to take a look at part 40 from the Hercules story from Richie's Fabulae Faculis. Now this part is called the Realm of Pluto, and you remember at this point in the story, Hercules is on his last labor, the 12th labor, where he needs to get um, Kerberos back, right? Cerberus, the Hellhound. And Richie has been giving us a, a little bit of an intro into what the underworld looks like, who's there, what happens to people when they go, and that sort of continues here. You're going to get a description of, obviously, the realm of Pluto, which is the underworld. Now, before we dive too far in, like I always tell you, the first thing you want to do is make sure you have the vocab under control. So if you can make yourself a vocab list or find one, um, there's a lot out there. Just make sure you have the vocab. Uh, Richie's does a really good job of repeating the vocabulary, so a lot of it will look familiar. But that being said, there's always new words that you just want to make sure that you have because it's really hard to translate the Latin if you don't know what the words mean. So always start there. The next thing you want to do is if you're in class, you want to find a partner, read the story aloud, right? Work on your speaking, your pronunciation. And then when you're done, right, your partner can read it back to you and you can work on your listening skills. You never want to shut those off. When you're trying to learn a new language, you don't want to leave speaking and listening out of it. Um, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. It all helps with reading comprehension and just understanding the language more naturally than looking at it um, and translating in your head. So always do that. The last thing I'd say when you're trying to master this, use the read and reread method, right? So read through the story once, write down any problem areas you might have, um, whether it's words you don't understand or, or little grammar phrases or full sentences, whatever it is, make a list and write it down, read through the whole story. Then when you're done, go back and look up all the words. That's the easy part, right? The vocab is pretty simple, but try to understand what's going on with the grammar too, right? Look at it, take a look at a commentary, whatever it might be, and try to figure out where you're going wrong. Then you go back and you read through the story again, a second, third, fourth time, whatever it is, you keep repeating that process and your list of problems should be getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you're able to read through this entire story without needing any vocab help, without needing any commentaries for the grammar, anything like that. And you can understand all, if not you know, pretty close to all of it. That's always a sign that you're ready to move on. You're in a good place, okay? So if you haven't done that yet, pause the video, go back and do it. Um, if you have, use the rest of the video just as a check to make sure that you're on the right track um, with what we're going to do now. My translation is never perfect, so you don't have to take it that way, but it should be a little guidepost just to help you through and make sure that you can feel, um, you know, that you got it and you're ready to move on, okay? So story starts like this. You have ut autem mane stigem hoc modo transierant ad alterum veniebant flumen quod lethe appellabator. So <clears throat> you have um, this continuation of the story of the underworld. So you have whoever. When the shades, the manes, remember those are, I, I use the word shades, it's like spirits, right? I think shade is kind of a, a, a fun description of them, um, but it's the dead sort of soul or spirit. So when the shades had crossed um, had crossed over the sticks, right? Stigem, that's the um, the river sticks with Karen, the boatman. Um, we already saw that in the previous chapter. So when they had crossed over the sticks in this way, hope mode, right? Paying, paying the boatman and all these things. They came, when Yebon, right, they came to an altar in Flumen, to another river. So there's another river in the underworld, um, which, right, quote, Apelebator um, Lethe, which was called Lethe, right? So this is a really interesting um, river, and we'll see it in the next part. But the term Lethe in ancient Greek, right, um, is the word that means forgetfulness. And you're going to see why in the next chapter. So you have this interesting comparison um, between aletheia, which means truth, and Lethe, which is forgetfulness. And I'll explain it um, after we kind of get through the next sentence. But it continues on with this. You have ex hoc flumine aquam bibre cogebantor, quod cum fecissent res omnes in vita gestas e memoria deponeba. Okay, so from this river, ex hoc flumine, right? So from meaning the, the river Lethe, right? Uh, Kogibanta, they were um, sort of forced to drink the water, right? Aquam bibere. So they're forced to drink from the river Lethe, right? And then we continue on with why. Um, and you have kokum uh, fekisen. So, and when this had been done, right? Fekisen. So when this had been done, all the things, right? Res omnis. In vita gestas. So gestas there is your participle. So it's really all things having been done, um, you could say, uh, in vita, in life. Deponebant, they put aside, right? So after they drink the water, they put aside or, or, or put away all things that they had done in life, a memoria, from their memory. So in other words, they forget all their deeds, right? That's that's why it's called um, lethe, right? So I was saying um, lethe means uh, forgetfulness. Aletheia means truth, which um, in ancient Greek, the A is a negation. So aletheia literally means not forgetfulness, right? Which is kind of an interesting way of understanding um, how we would use the word truth. So there we go. Fun little side note. You can look that up um, if you want or look up the river Lethe, the, the rivers of the underworld. Um, there's a lot you can kind of do with it. But in this one, that's that's part of it, right? You kind of forget what you've done in life, okay? 
And then we continue on. And you have Deneque, ad sedem ipsius Plutonis, uh, when yebant, cuius introitus acane cerebro custodie batum. Okay, so finally, right, Deneque, finally, right, at last, when Yeban, they came to the Sedem Ipsius Plutonus, to the seat of Pluto himself. Now, Sedem, again, it, it can literally mean seat, um, meaning like his throne, but it also means like the abode or the home, right, however you want to take it. Um, it's sort of like in English, we'd say something like the seat of power. It doesn't necessarily mean you're talking about a chair. Um, so that's what's going on with Sedem, right? So when they make it to the abode, the seat, however you want to take it, of Pluto himself, right, um, whose entrance, cuius introitus, right? The introitus is the entrance. And the cuius is just showing possession, right? So whose entrance or entryway, custodie bator, was guarded by the cane cerbero, by the dog Cerberus, right? So this is where you can find um, Cerberus or Cerberus in, in ancient Greek, right? Um, in Latin, this is where you can find the hellhound, right? Right in sort of the heart of the underworld, okay? <laughs> Then it continues, you have Ibi Pluto Migro uh, Westitu Indutus Cum Uxore Prosopina in Solio Sedeba. Okay, so there, meaning in that place, Pluto um, dressed in Dutus, right, having put on or, or, or dressed in black clothing, right, the Westitu. So in all black, you can kind of imagine him. Um, Sedeba, he was sitting or sat Cum Uxore Prosopina with his wife Prosopina in Solio on a throne. Right. So you get this image. Um, you can see here, I think it's just like a Wikipedia um, image. But the idea of, 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 you know, Hades or Pluto, his wife, Proserpina, they're on their, their throne. They're dressed in black. And you have um, uh, Cerberus, right, the dog nearby. Then it continues. You have Staban etiam non proco ab eo loco tria alia solia in quiba sedeba minos radamantos I, um, Iacus, Iacusque, there we go, Iacusque, uh, Udicase Apud Inferos. So this part you might not have necessarily heard of before, but again, I'd encourage you to look up all the um, sort of mythology of the underworld. But you have Pluto on his throne, and then you have <clears throat> also um, Staban. That, that means they were standing, but the subject is sort of at the end of this um, little phrase, Tria Alia Solia, three other thrones. So you can say three other thrones also stood um, not physically standing, but they're kind of located, non procul, not far away from that place, Abeo Loco, right? Meaning from uh, Pluto's throne. Okay, so there's three other uh, thrones in which, in Quibus, Sedebant, right? So this group of people was sitting or were sitting, Minos, Radamantes, and Iacus, right? So these three um, people, and these are actually um, kings, right? So that is the King Minos you might be thinking of. You can look them up. Um, these are three famous mortal kings. And now their job is to be the Eudicates, right? The judges. So there we're sitting with these three kings, the Eudicates, Apud, and Ferris, the judges among the dead, right? The judges of the dead. So these three mortal kings become, um, uh, Pluto is obviously the ultimate judge, but they they judge your, your shade or your soul when you show up at the underworld um, against kind of what you did in life, all right? Then it continues, you have he mortuis justicebat uh, et primia poinasque constitueba. So these, right, he is talking about the um, uh, the three judges, right? So these, justicebat, um, uh, you can uh, translate as they sort of pronounced or passed judgment, they spoke judgment, um, pronounced judgment for the dead, mortuis, right? So they pronounced judgment for the dead and they decided, right, constitueban, they decided primia, rewards, and poinas, punishments, right? So depending on what you did and kind of how they, they measure out your soul, you're either going to get, you know, good things or bad things, right? That's that's kind of one way to interpret. Then we get this last line. You have boni enim in campus elicios sedem beatorum uh, when yebant. Improbi autem in tartarum mitebantor ac multis et varies suppliciis ebi excruciebantor. Okay, so the bony, you have two groups of people, the bony and the improbi, right? The bony are the good, the improbi are the wicked, right? So the bony, the good, um, when, he, uh, when he, they came into the Campos Elysius, the Elysian fields, right? This is that sort of um, as close as you kind of get in uh, in Roman studies to a, a good afterlife, right? If you ever seen the movie Gladiator, they mention it at the beginning of that film, right? So Elysium or the Elysian fields, uh, Elysian fields, right? So the good ones go there and it's described as the sedem beatorum, right? The seat or the home or abode, however you want to translate that, of beauty, right? So it's really nice. That would be sort of the, the picture on the left, right? The good place. Then you have the improbi who are the wicked, right? So the wicked, however, and again, these are both um, substantive, uh, substantive adjectives. So bony means like good people, really, and improbi means improbi, right? 
bad people or wicked people. So the wicked, however, um, Mete Bantor, they were sent in Tartarum, into Tartarus. You might have heard that um, that phrase before. Not a good place to be. So they're sent to Tartarus. Um, and then you have Ibi there, right? Or and there, you might say, Akibi. And there, um, excruciate Bantor, they were they were suffi, uh, suffering, right? That's where you get the word excruciating in English, right? So they're being tortured is the idea. They were suffering um, from multisitwari supliques, right? From uh, many and various punishments. So you get a bunch of punishments and they have a, a wide variety of ways to torture you, right? In targets. So um, Richie is hitting on this uh, this idea of sort of different places in the underworld where you might end up, depending on if you're good or bad. And this is all based on the judgment you get from those three judges, okay? And they sit near, um, near the throne of Pluto. So Hopefully you've heard um, this before, some of it before. Like I said, if you haven't, feel free to do a little um, research. You know, there's a lot of good sites out there that will give you um, an overview of the, the, the underworld, right, in ancient uh, Roman interpretation of it. Um, and it ties into the Greek as well. So if you haven't seen it, uh, feel free to look it up and get more idea. Some of this you might have heard before, but maybe not this exact thing. So either way, it's a good um, sort of uh, launch point to go into some mythology and just get a sense of what um, you know Richie's is talking about here, right? Where, where is he coming up with this? They come. There's a lot of different myths about the um, the underworld, so you might have only heard a little piece of it, but that's where he's getting this information from. Okay, so always a good chance to to look at some mythology. As far as the Latin goes, um, there's nothing too too crazy here. There's maybe one, if I remember right. Um, uh, subjunctive phrase. So it's a lot of pretty straightforward um, indicative sentences. So it might feel a little bit easier, you know, just with, with some vocab mix in. But if you have any questions at all, feel free to put them in the comments below. I'm happy to help. Otherwise, just keep at it and keep practicing. Like I said, do that read and reread method. And when you can get to a point where you can read through this and your understanding is pretty close to perfect, if not perfect, right? Um, that's that's the, the sign that you're ready to move on and go on to the next chapter. Good luck.